Last Sunday, I brought my dad's Bible to read out of, and that was his Bible which he used so many, many times. I have, again, in honor of dad, brought another Bible. I'm not sure how much he used this, but I preach from it because it had warm memories from the person who gave it to him back in 1967. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading from verses 4 down to 17. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening For the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. We return once again to the great letter to the Hebrews, And even as we have been considering the greatness of Jesus in his person and also in his work, we hasten toward the conclusion of this letter, but we have Jesus being held out to us as the infinitely greater, the far supreme one. But there comes a question. If in Christ we have entered into such riches. If God is our heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ has obtained our salvation, how is it that from time to time, and even for long stretches of time, we go through deep, deep valleys of difficulty and struggle? How is it that there are trials and tests. Is it not right that those who have entered into Christ should have smooth, easy sailing all the way from salvation to glory? Here we have the answer plainly given to that. For these Hebrews, they were in danger of drawing back and drawing away from the greatest privilege that they had ever entered into or that any of us could possibly 
dream of. They were in danger of forfeiting. In like manner to Esau, they were in danger of pulling away and of losing wealth untold. First of all, we begin in verse 4, and this comes right on the heels of how that we have been directed and indeed commanded to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the one who has begun and completed, perfected our faith, the one who endured the cross and despised the shame and is sat down at the right hand of God, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, all the while being cheered on by those who we have heard from in Hebrews chapter 11, as we run the race, they are cheering for us and we are to run with endurance, pressing toward the mark. We are told here, and these first of all, these first readers, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Is it not true that we typically overestimate the situation? That we, in the midst of it, portray it as a blacker situation and a more hideous and horrible pit than what it really is? Think of those people in Hebrews chapter 11. You scan through those couple of pages and the great lives that were lived in the Old Testament and we want to stand up and cheer for them for the victories that they won. However, however, when they were in the midst of what they were going through, it most certainly did not feel any more victorious than what we endure and ride through today. I think of Moses. You remember how that at the burning bush, he had told God, look, I'm just not interested. You better go and find somebody else. I am going to be the biggest foot dragger that you can possibly imagine. God dealt with him rather sternly and Moses did relent and go. And you would think that God would say to Moses, all right, look, because you are so reluctant, I am going to make everything nice and smooth and everything is just going to go your way. And because I've had to really twist your arm, this is how it's going to go. But first of all, we find that Moses is at complete odds with his wife over the circumcision of their son. And then he gets back into Egypt, and though the leaders of the children of Israel welcome him and are encouraged, he goes into Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, you've got to be kidding. I'm not going to let the children of Israel go. This God who you refer to, I have no knowledge, I have no recognition, I have no honor to bestow to him, and there is no stinking way that I am going to listen to what he has to say. So the children of Israel, who at first were ready to stand up and cheer for this Moses coming back to lead them forth, all of a sudden things go from bad to worse. And it isn't long before Moses is looked upon as the real problem. Moses who didn't want the job in the first place, he is looked upon as the slime who has gotten them into even hotter water than they were ever before. And they are saying, would you please go back to wherever you came from? Finally, they get out of Egypt. What's one of the very first things that happen? They come to the Red Sea and they are hemmed in and Pharaoh and his army are coming down hard upon them. And once again, the people, they are thinking, who in the world came up with this Moses guy that he should get us into hot water? They go through the wilderness wanderings and it seems like one bad episode after another. God 
he specifically will lead us. If you think that you are smart enough that you think, okay, I am going to guide my footsteps whereby I am going to take out insurance policy upon insurance policy whereby I will avoid every pitfall and every difficulty, I have some news for you that God at times will most specifically steer your boat into the most stormy waters that you might trust in him. But these people, these Hebrews, they had not yet resisted unto blood. Many Christians in the first century and ever since most certainly have. Hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands. Their blood has been shed, but here these ones, they were painting things as worse than perhaps they were. And we are most certainly no better. And they had forgotten something that they should have held on to with white knuckle grip. Verse 5 says, Ye have forgotten the exhortation. You have forgotten the good word which was given to you, which speaketh unto you as children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. You remember back in verse 2 of this same chapter that we are told that Jesus on the cross despised the shame. And to despise something is to make little of it. The people, they would say, how could Jesus bear that shame? And Jesus is saying, for what is being accomplished through my death and through this work of God, the bringing in of so many to glory, to salvation, to life everlasting. Jesus said, that shame, it's just a small little thing. And I will gladly bear it for what is being accomplished in the eternal plan of God. But now, flip that over, whereas previously Jesus made little of that shame, we are told here that for us, we are not to despise the chastening of the Lord. Not to say, oh, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's something to be ignored. It is something to be avoided. It is not worthy of us. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Why? Because it is God's gift to us. It is something whereby he is accomplishing his eternal purposes. And if we skirt it, if we try to steer and curve around it, then we are missing something that is indeed a gift of the Lord. Now, everything that I have just said, I do not fault you if you say you are out of your mind because I would have to agree with you and we'll come to how that the text here honestly speaks of the natural response to these things. Verse 6 says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Here is a demonstration of God's love for us, that he will not leave us as we were, but he is working as a potter, working the clay, taking off pieces, adding in, molding, shaping that we might be conformed to his image, whom the Lord loveth. And here his love is poured out upon us. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? 
Verse 8 has some language that we don't typically use in church. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all, all in the family of God are partakers, then ye are illegitimate. Ye are bastards and not sons. You see, a key mark of being within the family of God is, in fact, that he is at work in us and that his love is poured out upon us and that we are indeed a part of the family of God and that he is deeply, deeply concerned with the character in which we live and that is an ingrained part of us. Verse 9 says that And it brings us into the natural world of fathers and sons, fathers and children. We have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them the reverence that was rightly due unto them. If that be so, and it is, if that be so, then should we not, to our heavenly Father, who has loved us with an even greater love, and who has done so very much more for us, should we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And the question hangs there, and of course the answer is absolutely. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, as they discerned and as they saw fit, but he, but our heavenly Father, for our, let me add this word, perfect profit. He for our profit, for our gain, for our growth, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Holiness. Verse 11 brings this into the world of reality. Back in verse 2, when it talks about Jesus, how he endured the cross and despised the shame, it wasn't that he just delighted in those nails and that whip, which so, with, with fiery intensity, shot pain into his system. It wasn't that he delighted in the weakness that came upon his body and the blood trickling down the cross, dropping onto the stones beneath him. It was that he was delighting in what that was accomplishing for all eternity, your salvation and mine. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. And we all say a hearty amen to that when we're either being disciplined as a youngster or when in the midst of life we're going through a deep valley and it seems that the waves are going to absolutely send us down for the last time. No chastening for the present when we're in the midst of it seems to be a joy, but a heaviness, a grief. Nevertheless, afterward, it is bringing about something that is of such precious value that we gladly endure these things in order to gain what the outcome is. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. This has never been my experience, but I understand that there is something called a jogger's high. A jogger's high. Something goes on in the body as people are are running and you see them out in all kinds of crazy weather and there's some type of of a drug that goes through the system naturally produced by the body that just gives a sense of elation and delight that they're out there. 
as I say, never, never had that experience. Any type of exercise has always been a burden and a grief, never joyous. But, but, whether an athlete or someone exercising has that particular experience during the motions, to have that outcome of a stronger body, a, a toned body, they are gaining something here for us. There is very definitely a gain. Now, verses 13, 14, pardon me, verses 12, 13, and 14 outline for us the title that I have given to this message, the strengthening and straightening that leads to sanctification. Verse 12 is strengthening. Verse 13 is straightening. Verse 14 is sanctification. Here's how it works. We have been told that there is a purpose. There, it's not willy-nilly in the plan of God what happens to us. God does all things and he is drawing us unto himself and working us even as the potter. Nothing is missed in the economy of God and in his dealing with us. But there is now a call for a certain response from us. Verse 12 says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. There is to be a strengthening that takes place as a result of God's kindness to us, as a result of his love that he has poured out upon us, as a result of the plan that he has to cause us to grow and to be stronger in him. We are no longer to be hunched over and to be dreaming of better days and thinking of how that seemed just fine before Christ came along. The writer to the Hebrews says, Wherefore, lift up, strengthen the hands which hang down. These people were despondent in their spirit. They were cast down. But the writer is saying, Let it not be so. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 13 says, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, and let it rather be healed. These people, they had wandered this way, and they had wandered that way, and they were actually intending on retreating from their position, but the path is laid out in front of them, and they are told, now let your run be the shortest distance between two points, and that is a straight line. Make straight paths for your feet. Those things which pull you to the right or to the left, those things which pull you back, let them fall to the ground, let them fall aside, and let it be that your paths be straight. And follow peace with all men and... Holiness. Here is both the horizontal and the vertical perspective that is held out. The holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How important is it that we be a, a people of holiness? That we not simply be a people of redemption or of adoption or of cleansing or of forgiveness, but that we be a people of sanctification. Sanctification is a word that we have encountered before in the book of Hebrews, and it describes that complete work of God, whereby a wretched sinner that is dead in their trespasses and sins has been brought to life, and they have been cleansed, they have been forgiven, they have been adopted into the family of God, and they are set on the road to heaven. And that final work of sanctification 
is that those things which have so entangled in our hearts and whereby we actually love our sin. And this is something that if you yet feel that pull, you are not alone. The believer, until we enter into glory, will forever fight against the body and against sin. The devil is a guerrilla warrior. He does not play by any rules. He will do anything to take you down. He will dangle that favorite sin in front of your eyes, and he will endeavor to cause that which you yourself have previously craved. He will endeavor to hold that before you and say, you used to love that. Don't you love it still? And everything inside of you will suddenly leap. But the Lord and his word will graciously draw you back. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. These people, they were in danger and encouragement is being held out to press on. The final three verses. We are to look diligently, lest any man. We're not just concerned about me, myself, and I, but we are concerned about the body of Christ. Looking diligently while we follow peace and while we pursue this holiness, while we make straight paths and while we lift up the hands and strengthen them, the hands that have previously hung down and the knees that have been so feeble and wobbly and barely hold us up. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. And Esau is a classic example here, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one bite, for one morsel of meat, sold something of inestimable value, his birthright. Afterward, when he realized what a blunder, what an idiot he had been, he sought for a place of repentance. He bawled his face off, is basically what it's saying, but he never came to that actual place of repentance. Ye know is the word that is sounded out to these Hebrews and through them to us. You know what a danger it was, how that afterward, after he realized how much had been lost, he would have yet inherited the blessing, but he was rejected and he found no place for repentance. He didn't get to that vital place that when John the Baptist started preaching and when Jesus started preaching and when the apostles started preaching, their word was repent, vital, vital word. Some people are mighty surprised by what's said here. They have for many years equated tears with repentance. But it is not so. There are many who have repented, who never shed a single tear. And there are many who have bawled and bawled, and as it were, filled the Nile River with tears. But they've never come to the point of repentance. Remorse is not repentance. A person can feel badly, a person can feel absolutely wretched about what they have done, but yet not turn from their sin and turn to God in humility. They might be still relying upon their own strength 
and upon their own ingenuity in which they might fix the problem somehow to their own gain and to their own credit. Repentance is something different. Strengthen and straighten and be sanctified. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Lord, we read from your holy word of the incredible importance of sanctification. And we would desire your work in each of our hearts. May we not run. May we not try to steer clear of the difficulties that you lead us into. May we understand that your love is yet there. It's not that we've done something wrong, that we have sinned. It is that you are working in us for your good pleasure. And may we surrender there as well to your will and to your design. So, Lord, help us, we pray, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior in the valley as well as the mountaintop, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.